Yes, I found a flaw in the model that I perceived is the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. People are being subjected to these systems of surveillance without any consent. Their cities and schools might say that because they're using networks, therefore they're consenting. And then they switch the conversation to then put the blame on the protester or your organizer to say, actually, it's your fault that you are using these systems, so therefore you're subjecting yourself to this, where it's really, these are the systems that you are placed in and you don't really have any choice. There's no bargaining. There's no opportunity to say, hey, I don't want to participate in this kind of structure. Hi, everyone. This is John Hansen from the Systemic Justice Project and the Flaw Magazine at Harvard Law School. In this pilot episode, Sam Perry and Rhea Singh speak with Jacinia Class about her recent article examining the growing use and reach of surveillance technologies. Their conversation focuses particularly on the chilling impact of those technologies on student activism at universities and the broader implications of these new forms of surveillance for everyone's privacy and civil rights. Welcome to Flaw School, the podcast about the flaws in the law. Welcome to Flaw School, a podcast that explores the flaws in our legal system. We're today's hosts. I'm Sam Perry. And I'm Rhea Singh. And we are so excited to be hosting Flaw School's first ever episode. Every two weeks, we interview law students to uncover the role of corporate actors in producing many of our most urgent social problems and the troubling tale of corporate actors shaping, bending, capturing, and breaking the law in their favor. In this episode, we'll be discussing suppression by surveillance. Today, we're joined by Jacenia Class, one of the most thoughtful, kind, and passionate people that I know, who just so happened to write an incredible article that we have the pleasure of discussing with her today. Welcome to Flaw School, Jacenia. Thanks for having me. All right, class is in session. Can you start by giving us just a little bit of information about you, Jacenia? My name is Jacenia. Uh, I'm a current law student, and I will be doing civil rights work after law school. And can you tell us just a little bit about your paper, just if someone hasn't read the article before, what should they know getting into this episode? So I'll be talking about a paper I wrote recently about surveillance technology in cities and universities. Um, And then we'll take a step back and look at the corporations that push for these technologies and what they were saying and what kind of threat this poses to people who are doing activism. Thank you so much, Jacenia. I guess I want to start with what inspired you to write this article? Yeah, um, there's just been so much activity in the past year. Um, You look across all schools, law schools, other graduate schools and big cities, you're seeing so much organizing and movement work and people rallying together to really um, embody their principles and, and push the actors around them to change. There's been so much activity that even the Supreme Court had to say something about it in a recent opinion. Um, But that has had consequences. A lot of corporate actors and um, from my perspective, big law firms uh, have taken action against people, particularly uh, student organizers, for participating in these protests. So I saw all of this around me and I grew curious about the steps that universities were taking uh, to respond to um, organizing on their campuses. And then this snowballed into research around um, the surveillance structures that they already have um, in that spanned out to cities. And I thought about the application of these two protests and the corporate actors behind them. Thank you, Jacenia. Um, Talking more about your perspective, can you tell us a little more about what you've experienced as a law student in terms of the student activism and protesting and what you've witnessed take place on campus? It's been really tough seeing the Uh, actions that have been taken against students uh, for participating in in protests. Uh, One really prominent example has been that a lot of students have been doxxed. And for people who aren't familiar, uh, doxxing is when uh, people's personally identifying information is posted online. 
Um, and this happened a lot, unfortunately, with people that are um, were participating in protests. And in my view, a lot of students, um, their information was posted on so many different websites. There were uh, buses that were circling around the campuses, um, shaming these students. And it's been really uh, troubling to see. It really, in my view, centered the conversation around the power that these corporations and technologies have to really um, impact people's lives. What sort of technology is being used to surveil student activism and protests? I talk about two different buckets of surveillance technology in this article. The first one I talk about are stingrays. Uh, these are cell site simulators uh, often used by law enforcement. Uh, and these are used generally to track people's location. Um, we've been seeing a lot of different actors use this kind of technology, um, often bouncing off of uh, cell phone towers or um, using local Wi-Fi networks in order to locate individuals. So certain universities have also been taking advantage of this um, technology. So for example, Syracuse University uses a program called Spotter EDU that allows it to track its students' locations to see whether they're in class uh, for tracking attendance. Uh, another technology that I talk about in the paper is, as many people know, facial recognition technology, which um, universities and cities have been using in order to identify students. Um, and this has been used in a lot of different ways. For example, the University of Miami used um, facial recognition systems to locate students that have participated in a protest for cafeteria workers on campus. As a public defender, I hear all of this and I'm like, oh my God, there is so much harm that can come with these technologies. What concerns come to mind for you when you think about these technologies and especially when it comes to activism? There are a lot of concerns with this technology. One of the first thing that jumps to mind is that often the technology is built upon really faulty data um, structures. So for example, one of the most prominent um, bad examples of this is um, facial recognition technology that misidentifies uh, people that are black and brown and come from minority communities. So often this um, it, the data is trained on your stereotypical a middle-aged white man, and it doesn't get it doesn't identify people who don't fit that mold. So the data set is is based on biased information. But even if the data got better, there's still so many other issues with this technology. You could think of the privacy concerns or the due process concerns of, of taking this information away from people. That there are just so many different ways to think about how tricky and troubling the integration of this technology is into our cities and universities. Okay, so lots of issues with the data, um, with facial recognition, and just thinking about how that can just have such a huge impact on a person's life. If they are misrecognized, misidentified, it's a little bit mind-blowing. Um, and I imagine that as these technologies continue to be used over time, um, more of these problems have become visible, right? So with this increased visibility of these problems that we're seeing with the technologies, has that had any negative impact on the use of these technologies? Do we see them being used less or with more hesitation or caution? Or are we continuing to see um, like a rise in their growth and use? Yeah, I, to me, this reads like a question of like which stories are coming across most prominently. And what I talk a lot about in this paper is that corporations are wielding their narratives to kind of put to the side our concerns with the data and the structures itself and focus on what are the what are the needs? Why do we need this kind of technology? So uh, there are so many examples that I talk about in this paper of different corporations and, and their actors um, kind of drumming up fear in cities and in universities to convince consumers to buy their products. A great example of this is Clearview AI. They engaged in a lot of marketing and conversations with police departments to convince them that their technology would help them protect children and enhance the safety of communities across the country. And other corporations did the same thing. Um, take Panasonic, for example. They released a marketing video that showed um, surveillance of students' social media to assess quote-unquote threats and 
really drummed up concern around school-based violence to say, hey, buy our product. We will bring the solution to you. And so despite there being a lot of very valid concerns with the data and the biases therein, corporations are spinning the conversation. They're saying, hey, we can solve these safety problems. Don't look at what our technologies do, but look how we can solve these concerns that I might argue are they're drumming up a lot, um, particularly as it relates to protest and, and political demonstrations. But that conversational switch is, is really important, I think, in convincing a lot of people uh, that this technology is necessary and making it more pervasive. I think that's, in a way, like gaslighting and being manipulative was something that is, it's taking freedoms away and it's like infringing on rights and they are able to spin it in a way to make it seem so important and so needed. And as someone in undergrad and as someone who was, you know, very much watching and involved in the protests on my campus, I can't help but have fear and just honestly disgust for the way that these narratives are being spinned around. But I do want to ask, as these universities and cities become more comfortable with using these technologies, how are they using them and how might they use it in the future? Yeah, I think those those fears are really valid. And my argument in the paper is that this is already happening in cities and universities, but I largely speculate that it's going to become more and more common for universities and cities to quote unquote deal with um, protests and organizing and movement building by relying on these forms of technologies um, in order to, um, in a way, suppress students from engaging in this kind of representation of their values and discourage people from joining in these efforts. And so I, I think that is what I imagine what cities and universities are doing with this technology and what people who are organizing or building movements to, should look to and consider when they're thinking about how they should strategize. Jessenia, how are the people you are talking to and the people you've seen, how are they reacting to this? It's a mixed bag. And, and I think it's really a personal decision that varies widely. Some people are fearful and with good reason of, of having their information posted online um, and the impact that that would have on their career and on their families. Um, other people are um, willing to take risks and are so passionate about their cause that they're um, committed to doing whatever it takes. Certainly there will be people who will continue to act in the face of more surveillance, but there are people that will be dissuaded from participating. And, and I think that's really uh, frightening to think that people will be less interested in expressing their political views as a result of the adoption of this technology in cities and universities. Yeah, that's huge. That really hits home, I think, thinking about how we feel so personally affected by the actions of these corporations, right, who are producing these technologies and how they're being employed. You mentioned in your article that the Stingray can mimic cell phone towers and that that creates barriers to sources of cell service. That really struck me. It's something I hadn't really thought about. As someone who's not technologically inclined, I don't often think about bandwidth. I don't know why I have bandwidth. I don't know why I don't have bandwidth. Um, but this is wild, right? The, those people, those corporations with the money to surveil and with the power to surveil really can control how and when people communicate, whether it's, you know, during some form of activism or just in their daily lives, right? And so it's wild to think that we can think about the role that surveillance plays during demonstrations, during protests, but even outside of those fears as well. Were you thinking about that too when you were writing the article? Yeah, for sure. I totally agree. I, I focused on some uh, examples of stingrays or facial recognition technologies or some of the programs like Spotter EDU that cities and universities are adopting. But I think your concern is, is a broader one that I think is right, is that the more that these technologies grow and there will be likely many others that I don't talk about in this article that will be important, 
these are all tools that powerful actors are deciding to use without the consent or the input of the people that they are largely impacting. And that is going to have a huge role in what I believe is people's main way of engaging in democracy, in expressing their opinion, in going to the streets, engaging with their uh, local authorities, uh, people who hold power. If they are going to be dissuaded by these technologies, that's going to be a really bad thing. And that brings me to the question of accountability, right? Like such a huge impact. How can we hold these corporations who are both creating and the corporations who are employing these technologies accountable for their impact? For instance, you mentioned that Amazon shareholders were concerned about recognition, the Amazon um, surveillance software. And I started reading through an article you linked, um, a Wired article. My jaw dropped when I read in there that the Amazon Web Services CEO, Andy Jassy, said to employees, quote, if we find people are violating folks' constitutional rights, they won't be able to use the services any longer, end quote. So loss of access to the technology is the consequence here. I mean, can we really imagine a world where people who are using, sanctioning the use of, or creating these technologies are actually held accountable for the harms they're producing besides maybe them just losing access to it? Um, is it possible when we think about how, you know, a technology can start in some way, shape, or form, and then when it's purchased, it can be adapted by whatever corporation to fit their particular needs? Like, who can we hold accountable? Can we hold anyone accountable? I like to think so. Um and I tell myself this as a current law student hoping to do this work in the future, I have to hold on to some hope that that there are ways in which we could um, encourage or push those in power to embrace the changes that we'd like to see in our society and in our systems. Um, and I think that there are a couple of tools that we might rely on to to make those changes or to at least pursue those changes. So one that I'm thinking about, especially with as you mentioned, recognition is the um, group of shareholders that wrote a letter to uh, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, in 2018, um, to put pressure on him to change and and um, reconsider um, their facial recognition technology. The group talked about how they used a lot of technical corporate law terms. Uh, they're talking about how. Um, they're, they don't see any evidence and documentation of fiduciary oversight, um, something that is really removed from the actual concern that people have with this technology. But they're leveraging the tools at their disposal in order to try and push actors towards uh, a future that doesn't rely on these technologies. And I think that, to me, is positive, though. And, and Amazon did change their actions. They took a, they put a one year moratorium on the facial recognition software. Of course, that was only one year, but that, that sparks hope for me. That convinces me that this is an option for change to happen. Um, other ways that I think are, are incredibly important is local organizing and local power building. You can see examples of, in the article, I talk about different cities like Somerville, Massachusetts, um, where people have uh, pushed their local cities to adopt ordinances where they will not use facial recognition technology. You'll, you've also seen uh, petitions that were circulated that 50 schools, 50 universities across the country have committed to not using facial recognition technology. And examples where protests itself, which is very ironic, but the very, I think, key to this discussion, um, protests itself at Northeastern University stopped the university from implementing um, usage monitors that could be used to track students' locations at their school. So I think that there, there are the typical um, pathways to pursue change, policymaking, uh, pushing your local legislatures, and all of it stems from building power and raising awareness of this issue and having conversations with people. Now, Jacinia, I would love to switch gears a little bit and think about how this topic is intertwined with the elements of systemic justice and injustice. In reading your article, I found myself toying with the notion of consent. 
a university like Columbia, for example, can say that the students consented to their text messages being read because they were sent on university Wi-Fi networks. I think it's wrong to say that people use Wi-Fi with the idea um, that like we're comfortable with the owner of the network inspecting and looking at any piece of data or messaging that runs across it. What do you think about that? Yeah, I I think you're hitting broadly on a theme that I wanted to get across in my article, which is that people, and in this case, I focus a lot on, on organizers and people who are protesting, but people are being subjected to these systems of surveillance without any consent. Their cities and schools might say that because they're using networks, therefore they're consenting. And then they switch the conversation to then put the blame on the protester or your organizer to say, actually, it's your fault that you are using these systems. So therefore, you're subjecting yourself to this, where it's really these are the systems that you are placed in and you don't really have any choice. There's no bargaining. There's no opportunity to say, hey, I don't want to participate in this kind of structure. And so that framing between this is an individual's fault as opposed to this is a system's fault and there are problems with this system that we need to change, that's something I really wanted to talk a lot about and focus on in this article. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, the idea of consent, for instance, you know, what's coming to mind for me right now is you mentioned in your article that once law enforcement has identified the cell phone of a protester, maybe that's through the Wi-Fi network, right? They can subpoena the cell phone company to provide both the name and address associated with that account. And, you know, much more other identifying information. Um, And again, you know, as a public defender, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to access that information and other information related to cell phone use from the other side. For instance, you know, I've had an experience, right, where we subpoena Snapchat. Snapchat will not answer us. And, you know, if they're forced to give a response, they'll say, we can't provide that information because it's the individual user's information and you should get that from them. Um, It's really a power imbalance, right? Like the corporations themselves can choose when they want to respond and to whom they want to respond. And I think it's a bit of a narrative that we don't hear too often. Like, I did not expect that going into my work, thinking that, the company won't respond to me, but they'll respond to law enforcement. Do you think that corporations are intentionally hiding that reality that, you know, there is that power imbalance? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's, it's probably a mix of both corporations using the powerful tools that they have at their disposal to intentionally hide things or place documents under seal and just use the army of lawyers that they have at their disposal to find any tool in the toolbox to uh, shield them from liability. It's both that, and then it's also the fact that people aren't aware that these things exist. People don't know enough about these structures to raise the alarm and gain access to their own information. And that's why I think some of the things that I talk about in the article, for example, the ACLU of DC puts together a Know Your Rights packet to inform organizers about technology that might impact them at protests. I 100% agree with you. Throughout reading, I was trying to think, you know, if there's someone who's reading this article that's a bit more skeptical about the narrative and about the stories that are being shared through it, you know, what would I be thinking? And so I got myself to the starting point of like, okay, if I was that person, what are my values? What are the things top of mind? Easily, my mind went to efficiency, right? That's like the quintessential goal of a corporation to, you know, well, they'll say that, right? We want to do things quickly and effectively. And I think about technologies like Spotter EDU, which we've talked a bit about earlier and how it like tracks the student's location and attendance in class, right? And if I'm someone who's efficiency oriented, I'm thinking this is great, right? We're tracking students' attendance through technology so professors can spend more time in the classroom focusing on material. That's awesome. Everyone's getting their money's worth. Great. But it's also terrifying, at least to me, so now I'm stepping a bit out of that, to think about how that sort of efficiency-centered narrative blurs out forces beneath the surface or motivations beneath the surface or power imbalances beneath the surface. How are we combating these stories? How are we talking with folks who are in that efficiency-oriented mindset about these issues? I think for me, it it all comes down to storytelling. 
if people are making an efficiency based argument, we need to challenge that by reorienting the conversation around the impact of these kinds of technologies. And some organizations take this tactic and some of them sidestep it. I've seen a lot of advocacy methods that have focused less on the narrative and more on different procedural ways to challenge these practices. For example, some organizations have focused on due process issues or privacy issues. I think that can only truly be effective if it's coupled with a media strategy that talks about how this is hurting people in real life and and how that really matters. I feel like with this surveillance, it seems like the students are getting their, you know, power taken away and it gives them a lot to be frightened about. And I share those feelings of being scared. Um, But it also does seem like there's hope and there are plenty of people we saw from the protests on campus throughout the encampments that despite administrators saying you're going to get your degrees taken away, you're going to lose this right, you're going to lose that right, people so strongly believe in what they you know fight for and I think that's beautiful. They are willing to deal with those consequences for what they know is right. But what sense did you get when you were talking to people and learning about their perspective? I felt really similarly. I was both surprised and heartened to see students that were undeterred in their commitment to organizing and pushing for change through uh, activism. These tools, these technological tools are really scary. And fighting against a system and asking for it to change is also really scary. And to see people with real consequences uh, being subjected to, to surveillance technology and even still double down in their commitment to their cause and continue pushing forward for the change they want to see in these systems and in the world, that's inspiring. That motivates me. Um, And I take that with me um, as a reminder to be committed to the changes that I want to see in this world. That motivates me in my career. The best thing that I would recommend is just to be connected, to talk to people about these issues, to open yourself up to information and learning about it, participating in activity that could change systems in a way that is aligned with those principles. That's beautiful. I, I think it, it gives a lot of hope. And I, I speaking from personal experience, like I can't speak as a public defender. I can't speak as someone who's in law school, but I definitely can attest to saying like being connected and talking to people, it really does make all the difference. For our listeners who are interested in this topic, what resources or further reading would you recommend? I would recommend checking out some of the great work that people are doing, like Surveillance Technology Oversight Project or STOP does a lot of work on this front. Also, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they've done some great research. There's also a book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuba. It's amazing. It's so detailed. And she dives into a lot of the themes that I touch on in this article. What I'd love for people to take away from this article is a reminder that they have power. You are an actor that has a lot of agency to push your systems in the ways that you want them to change. And it's hard. And they have a lot of power over you. And that's very, very difficult. But when you band together with people, and you have conversations, and you connect over shared interests and shared causes, that is the catalyst to change, I believe. And and I really hope that people feel empowered to do that with their own causes in their own communities, and, and make the change that they're interested in seeing in the world. I hate to say this, but that is all the time we have for today. Um, Justenia, it has been so fun talking with you today um, about an awful topic, but thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. If you're interested in reading Justenia's full article or learning more about the flaws in our legal system, check out The Flaw magazine at theflaw.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, Make sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts and check out flawschool.org for more content. Thanks for listening. Class dismissed.